congratulations. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to having a, like we said, smooth transition. Do everything we can to make sure you're accommodated, what you need. Politics is tough, and it's, uh, in many cases, not a very nice world, but it is a nice world today, and I appreciate it very much. A smooth transition. President-elect Donald Trump back in a familiar place, shaking hands once again with the man he will be replacing in the White House. He's also picking some of the most controversial members of Congress to serve in one of the most powerful positions in his cabinet. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. And tonight, there is a very, very good chance that right now, President-elect Donald Trump is feeling like he might have this wide-open uh, era on pushing through his entire agenda, and that's because Republicans will control Washington as we know it, and we're talking all about it. The White House, the Senate, as of today, NBC News is also projecting Republicans will control the House of Representatives as well. It'll be a razor-thin majority, but a majority nonetheless, and Trump met with them behind closed doors today, where he reportedly joked about a possible third term, which, of course, is constitutionally impossible. But after that meeting with House Republicans, Trump made his way to the White House, where he and President Biden seemed to get along. And what really seems to be the talk of the town right now in Washington are Trump's cabinet appointments. There's Senator Marco Rubio for Secretary of State, a pick that has earned bipartisan praise. And then there are names that have raised some eyebrows. For Director of National Intelligence, Trump has picked former Democratic Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, who has been accused by both parties of spreading Russian misinformation. And as for his attorney general... That is Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who could now lead the Justice Department, which once investigated him for sex trafficking of an underage girl. That investigation, though, was eventually dropped. No charges were ever brought. Speaker Mike Johnson is now saying Gates has offered his resignation from the House effective immediately. And NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has more. Tonight, the culmination of a comeback. President-elect Trump arriving in Washington, just as NBC News projected the GOP will keep its House majority. And tonight, Trump's announcing a series of new high-profile picks that have stunned even some of his allies. Among the picks, Trump defender Florida Congressman Matt Gates for attorney general that's sparking a bipartisan backlash. All of it as President Biden welcomed the president-elect to the White House, including a handshake inside the Oval Office. Mr. President-elect and former president, thank you, Donald. Congratulations. Thank you. After a heated campaign... Biden was a low-IQ guy 35 years ago. Trump is a threat to this nation. Any bitterness today was tucked away. Biden telling Trump, welcome back. Looking forward to having a, like we said, smooth transition. Do everything we can to make sure you're accommodated, what you need. And we're going to get a chance to talk about some of that today. So, Good. welcome. Welcome Thank back. You. Thank you very much. And uh, politics is tough. And it's, uh, in many cases, not a very nice world. But it is a nice world today. And I appreciate it very much. And a transition that's so smooth, it'll be as smooth as it can get. And uh, I very much appreciate that, Jim. You're welcome. Thank you all. The meeting lasted nearly two hours before even landing back in Florida. Trump rolled out those new transition picks, including Gates, a lightning rod. Trump ally Steve Bannon telling NBC News, President Trump is going to hit the Justice Department with a blowtorch. And Matt Gates is that torch. Donald Trump is unstoppable. Elect him president again, and America will be unstoppable too. Though Gates has also been fiercely criticized by fellow Republicans. Trump today announcing Tulsi Gabbard to serve as director of national intelligence. A former Democratic congresswoman from Hawaii and military veteran, Gabbard campaigned for Trump and recently became a Republican. But I'm proud to stand here with you today, President Trump, and announce that I'm joining the Republican Party. But she's faced bipartisan criticism for secretly meeting with Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad. And overnight, a surprise pick, even to some of Trump's allies. Fox News host Pete Hegseth for defense secretary, a Princeton and Harvard graduate and combat veteran who earned two bronze stars. Hegseth just days ago saying this about women in combat. Because I'm straight up just saying we should not have women in combat roles. 
It hasn't made us more effective, hasn't made us more lethal, has made fighting more complicated. And he's echoed Trump's argument that the Pentagon has veered away from its military focus to pursue progressive policies. The woke stuff will be gone within a period of 24 hours, I can tell you. Any general that was involved, general, admiral, whatever, that was involved in any of the DEI woke has got to go. Uh, either you're in for war fighting, that, and that's it. And that's the only litmus test we care about. But some Democrats argue he lacks the experience to lead 1.3 million active duty troops and to oversee an $800 billion budget. The selection of this person who has very little, very little experience in running uh, the largest department in the federal government, serious concerns. The president-elect also announcing billionaire Trump supporter Elon Musk and entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy will lead a new so-called Department of Government Efficiency. Nobody's smarter than Elon. It's an idea Musk originally pitched to Trump, who says the goal is to create more efficiency and less bureaucracy by providing advice and guidance from outside of government. It currently does not exist, and it's unclear how it'll be funded, though Musk has touted massive savings. Well, I, I think we can, we can do at least $2 trillion. Yeah! And Gotti, tonight we're learning more about that meeting behind closed doors in the Oval Office. The White House calling it cordial and substantive. President-elect Trump says it was a really good meeting, telling the New York Post that he and President Biden spoke about the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, and that Biden shared his views and was very gracious. Gotti? Peter Alexander, thank you. And let's bring in NBC's Vaughn Hilliard from West Palm Beach. Uh, Vaughn, let's let's start with Matt Gates here. Was this a shocker? Yes. Uh, it, it, how about this, Scotty? Matt Gates was on the plane this morning from Mar-a-Lago to Washington D.C. to join Donald Trump on Capitol Hill. Right, and there wasn't too much attention really paid to the fact that Matt Gates was part of a very small entourage joining Donald Trump by his side in his motorcade, along with Elon Musk, because really there is no greater political ally you could make the case than Matt Gates over the years. And it's not crazy to see him standing alongside Donald Trump. But when the announcement came, while well, Donald Trump and Matt Gates were flying back here to Mar-a-Lago, that it was Gates, it absolutely turned the heads. I think the reactions up on Capitol Hill were really representative, even Republican lawmakers who were questioning whether it was for real or not. And that's because Matt Gates is somebody who was never really involved in attorney general conversations. And he was really a, a part pariah, part MAGA hero up on Capitol Hill and somebody who will definitely make a great many Republicans uncomfortable, whether that's not uh, enough to stop his confirmation through the U.S. Senate. That's another story. But uh, there's definitely a, a lot of folks that had saw him sort of as a congressional provocateur, somebody who would appear with mm -hmm. places like at that New York courthouse alongside him on the campaign trail. But to now be attorney general, uh, that surprised a great many people. Yeah, we've heard of this term like team of rivals. And yet you kind of think about that when you're starting to see some of these appointments and you look at the resume and you look at the person um, and, and you realize that in some cases it does seem like the antithesis of the role is the person that's being chosen. Is that part of the disruption here? Right. And I think that that's exactly kind of the role that Donald Trump has so often played in our politics over the last decade. Right. Gotti and Matt Gates is somebody who has said that the Department of Justice needs to get rid of uh, individuals who are uh, sought the political the prosecutions, in his words, of Donald Trump. And if not, they need to get rid of the Department of Justice entirely. Those were the words of the man who has been tasked to helm the Department of Justice just one year ago. And so sort of his disruption is by coming in there and blowing up the system. And I think that that's where for many of the career prosecutors, right, top officials working for the top law enforcement uh, department in the country, there is a lot of consternation in Washington, D.C. about exactly what his plans are and the extent to which he'll seek to fire a great many of those career prosecutors who have really come in and done uh, a political work, but instead done the job of what is the chief executive law enforcement agency in the country. And, and speaking of people who, who hire and fire, uh, Trump was in Washington today. There were reports that Elon Musk was there with him, uh, possibly in the GOP House meeting. What do we know about that dynamic? And how is Elon Musk operating within the Trump world right now? 
really he's become a top advisor, top friend of his ever since election night more than a week ago now. He has been there at Mar-a-Lago, a near constant presence, I'm told. And somebody who uh, invested more than $100 million of his, own camp, uh, of his own money towards Donald Trump's candidacy in the last uh, months of the campaign, and clearly somebody who Donald Trump has relied on. Now, let's be very clear, back in 2022, it wasn't that long ago, it was Donald Trump who was literally calling Elon Musk a BS artist. And those two were really kind of in a very public war between themselves. But the two men, Donald Trump, now the incoming president of the United States, and Elon Musk, the richest man in the world, have built this symbiotic relationship. It's not clear exactly where it's going to go, but Donald Trump said that he wants him to, from outside the government, serve as a consultancy role to how to trim uh, government spending and trim the government workforce. And Elon Musk has said that he wants to play that exact role for him. Yeah, such a reminder that this timeline is a continuum, and we'll see what happens next. Ron Hilliard, thank you. And with Donald Trump headed back to the White House, special counsel Jack Smith and his team are actually planning to quit before Trump takes office. You might be wondering what all this means for the two federal cases he's wrapped up in. Well, the election interference in classified documents case, there's a chance that nothing happens. The Justice Department has a long-standing policy that it cannot charge a sitting president with a crime. NBC legal analyst Angela Sinandella joins us now. A Angela like, this is the most impossible question I could ever ask you, but what happens now? What, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, Gotti, so I would actually say this is the least shocking news of the day and that these cases <laughs> will go away. It's far more than just a chance. I would say it is pretty much a guarantee. And that's because, as you mentioned, the Department of Justice does have this longstanding policy not to prosecute sitting precedents. They also might even apply to president-elects. And it's not just an understanding, like a wink. It's actually a binding policy on federal prosecutors. So what Jack Smith has done so far is he has told both courts in Florida, the appeals court, and also in D.C., and just asked for time to figure out how best to wind these cases down, given the unprecedented circumstances. So that means these cases will go away. Trump himself has said that if Jack Smith does not resign, that he immediately upon taking office will certainly fire Jack Smith. So Jack Smith is just preempting that by indicating that he will resign. And will go away without like a peep or will go away with a, a report summarizing the investigation? Yeah, that's a great question. So usually what happens in these cases is that the special prosecutor will make a massive report, which will then go to the attorney general, who will review it. There'll be lots of back and forth with regards to redacting classified information, and then it will be sent to Congress, and then also at the same time, usually released to the public. Now, again, this is unprecedented, so it's unclear if that report will likely be generated but will necessarily be released to the public. And if it does, though, it's also unclear if there will be even any relevations or any new findings given the thousands of pages of filings that Jack Smith has produced. And also in Florida, because the center of that case is classified documents, you don't expect to see a lot of classified information there making its way into the report in a way that would be revealed to the public, Gotti. And Angela, if you can help me with this, I don't know, kind of a big picture question. Is this basically presidential immunity at work or are we looking at like a new era or, or almost like a, a new precedent for how presidential immunity will work in the future. So I will say that it's really a race against time. And we always expected that if we got to this point, that these federal cases would go away, given the DOJ policy, not just on one side, but a longstanding one that has affected every president in the past and would likely affect every president in the future. So it's really just a question of was Donald Trump's team able, which they were, to successfully delay and stall these cases enough to get to this point where the Department of Justice could not secure any convictions whatsoever. However, I will say with the state cases, those could just be paused. There will be no trials during his presidency, but that doesn't mean that four years down the line, they will get picked back up again, Gotti. Angela Sinandella, thank you.
And the wildfire outbreak and dry spell across the Northeast is getting more critical by the day. New Jersey is now under a drought warning, and if rain does not fall soon, it could lead to mandatory water restrictions there. And this comes as firefighters are still working to contain the Jennings Creek wildfire burning at the New York-New Jersey border. That one is 50 percent contained, threatening about 100 structures right now. And officials say they have responded to more than 500 fires in New Jersey since early October. Now that is push, putting major reservoirs at risk as crews battle these fires requiring hundreds of thousands of gallons of water during record-setting dry conditions. And NBC's Antonia Hilton has the latest. Antonia? There are some serious challenges ahead in this region, and this reservoir tells you exactly why. All behind me here, there should be water lifting up this dock. And then take a look over here. This right here is the water line. I think it says everything about the kind of drought that this part of the country is dealing with right now. Combine that drought with a lack of future precipitation in the forecast, the low humidity currently in the air, and the winds that we've been dealing with in this part of the country right now. And that is the perfect storm that makes it so hard to prevent and then to fight these fires when they happen. Hundreds of fires just in the last several weeks, unlike anything this region has seen in years. The one of grave concern to people in New Jersey and New York is the Jennings Creek wildfire, the one that is raging across about 5,000 acres. It's about 30 percent contained right now. Hundreds of personnel are on the ground and in the air fighting this fire right now. But it has become such a threat that there are people in the area who are ready to evacuate at a moment's notice. It's estimated that about 100 private residences are at risk, although not currently harmed right now. And so the hope is they can get more of this fire contained, but it bears repeating. There are some basic steps everyone needs to take right now to prevent more of these fires from happening. Now is not the time to carelessly dispose of smoking products while out on a walk or a hike, to park your car on the grass or on dry leaves, and do not grill or take out sparking power tools. These kind of simple errors and mistakes and steps, they can lead to these massive fires that drain resources and lead to all these teams on the ground doing everything they can do to prevent and fight them as more start to pop up. But again, we're looking at a forecast where there may not be a whole lot of rain coming in future days, which means we're living with these conditions for a while. Back to you. Antonia Hilton, thank you. Let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, what does this drought warning say about how bad things are getting out there in the North Northeast? Yeah, I think we all know how bad it is as far as like the brush fires that have been forming and some of the wildfires. But now we're starting to get some of the reservoir levels going down pretty quickly, too. So now they're starting to get concerned about, you know, the drinking water. And when we get to that level, that's when we have some major concerns. So this is the drought for the monitor, we call it. This is what's happened. This comes out every Thursday. So this will be updated tomorrow. And it, it takes into account where it's rained and where it hasn't. And, you know, going into last week, we had 49 states that were reporting drought. The worst of it was in the middle of the country through the Ohio Valley through West Virginia and then in the mid-Atlantic and then spotty spots on the bottom half of the country. The rainfall forecast over the next seven days looks really beneficial for Texas, Oklahoma, up through Wichita, uh, through Illinois, back through the Great Lakes. Notice we're not going to get much, if any. So our fire season is going to continue, especially in Southern California. It looks like we have a Santa Ana wind event coming the middle of next week. So we have to keep a close eye on that. So no rainfall for you, but the Pacific Northwest is going to get numerous storms. But then over my shoulder here, unfortunately, in the Northeast, look at this, nothing. No rain at all in the next seven days. So anytime it's going to be breezy or windy, we're going to go to those red flag warnings again. The reservoir levels are going to continue to drop, Gotti. So this story has no signs of ending, at least through the middle of November. Yeah. And what's the latest with that sketchy looking storm brewing down <laughs> in the Caribbean? Yeah, the concerns for Honduras. I mean, they're going to get this no matter what, and the rainfall is going to be a huge problem for them. So here's our list of our names of storms, and when we do get in this one named, it will be Sarah. And we expect that to happen in the next two days, uh, maybe at the worst by the time we get to the weekend. It's already showing a lot of thunderstorm activity, which means it has a lot of rainfall with it. You notice where Honduras is located. Here's the forecast from the Hurricane Center. It drifts it. This year, three days in a row, it's going to sit just off the coast or on the coast of Honduras. Honduras has mountains, tropical systems and mountains. We saw what happened in you know, western North Carolina mm -hmm. with Helene. It's a bad recipe. The rainfall forecast is 10 to 20 inches for Honduras with isolated spots going up to 30 inches of rain. That 
is going to cause mudslides. Life-threatening flash flooding is going to be a huge concern. Then after that, we will be watching this system kind of meandering. Eventually, it will head towards the Yucatan. Again, the more land interaction, the weaker the storm will be. If it stays off the coast of Honduras and it only clips Cozumel and Cancun, that's worst-case scenario for Florida because it'll be a stronger storm. So that's what we're going to have to monitor. You know, if any impacts in Florida, Gotti, it's still going to be seven days hmm. from now. Yeah, still terrifying. 30 inches of rain, and that's just round one. A lot to watch out for. Bill Karens, thank you. And Kansas City Chief players Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey, two of the biggest stars in the NFL, had their homes broken into last month. And police say this happened a day before and the day of a Chiefs home game on October 7th. Police also say the thieves left Kelsey's house with $20,000 in cash. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch has more. Pressure, Mahomes throws, completes, Kelsey. More than a month after alleged burglaries at the homes of Kansas City Chiefs Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey, tonight investigators still have not named any suspects tied to the incidents, which occurred just hours apart. Before today's practice, Mahomes speaking publicly for the first time since the news broke. It's frustrating, it's uh, disappointing. Um, but, uh, I mean, I can't get into too many of the details because the investigation is still ongoing. According to a sheriff's report, just after midnight on October 6th, there was a break-in without forced entry at Mahomes' massive home about 25 miles outside Kansas City, Missouri. The property featured in Netflix series Quarterback. I was like, man, I'm going to be here. I might as well build the exact house I want. Then the next evening, there was a forced entry at Kelsey's home, roughly eight miles away, according to a police report which said $20,000 in cash was stolen. Oh, there's a tight end, Kelsey. That alleged incident unfolding while the Chiefs hosted the Saints on Monday Night Football. <laughs> Kelsey's girlfriend, superstar Taylor Swift, was also in the stadium. And while the couple has not commented, Kelsey's brother, Jason, had talked about the romance's security challenges before this incident. He had to completely move out of his house. And tonight, police are not commenting on how burglars could access the homes of two of the world's biggest names. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News. Jesse, thank you. And a mother in Georgia is facing charges and potential jail time after not realizing her 10-year-old son walked to town alone. She is now fighting back, saying she did nothing wrong, but the incident is raising questions about how much parenting is too much or too little. NBC's Yasmin Vesugin has more on that story. A mother of four, shocked to be arrested in front of her children. It was anger and frustration, of course, because my children were having to witness that. All because her then 10-year-old son was spotted walking alone in Mineral Bluff, Georgia, a town with a population of about 370. It's, it's really not even a town, hardly. It's not a super dangerous or even dangerous at all stretch of road. Brittany Patterson lives less than a mile from town with her father and children. On October 30th of this year, she had to take her eldest son to a medical appointment. Her youngest son, Soren, didn't want to come, she said, so she left him at home. Then she received a call from a police officer. So when you got that phone call from the police officer saying, hey, do you know your kid is in town? What did you think? I said no. <laughs> I didn't know he was in town. I was not expecting them to say that, but I wasn't terrified for him or or scared for his safety. The police officer drove Soren home, she says, and made it clear it was problematic. Brittany didn't know where Soren was. At that point, Brittany thought the ordeal was over until officers showed up that evening to arrest her. They asked me to put my hands behind my back and all that stuff, and I realized what was going on. Brittany was taken to county jail, booked, and then released on $500 bail. She's now facing a misdemeanor charge of reckless conduct. The arrest warrant saying she, quote, knowingly did endanger the bodily safety of her juvenile son. If found guilty, she could face up to one year in prison and a $1,000 fine. The DA's office didn't provide us with a comment. Local police declined to issue a statement, and we did not hear back from child services. Prosecutors asking Brittany to sign a safety plan before they'd consider dropping the charges, according to her lawyer. It's, we want to witness you downloading the app, GPS app to your son's phone. Okay, and then you've got to... Check on where he is. Really? And he's got to let you or grandma know where he is at all times. But Brittany and her attorney are unwilling to accept this deal. This is not right. I did nothing wrong. And um, I'm going to fight for that. The story is striking a nerve as technology inundates our lives, giving parents more control over their children. So how much freedom should kids still get? Like, are all parents going to have to 
put GPS on their child. And when I asked about the law in Georgia, when it comes to kids being able to be on their own. That parents get to decide for their children unless it is unreasonably dangerous. And Brittany agrees it should be a personal decision. You know, part of it is knowing your neighborhood and knowing your area and, and what your level of comfortability is with each child. An assessment Brittany made about Soren and hopes the DA will as well. Yasmin, thank you. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, calls for transparency about what is up in the sky. The long-awaited congressional hearing on UAPs is in the book. So did we learn anything new? Well, we're going to take you through all of it with the congresswoman who led today's questioning, Nancy Mace. Plus, genetic testing giant 23andMe is at a crossroads. What the company's business woes could mean for customers' personal data. And later this hour, supercharging the boating experience. We are taking a ride on on a speedboat that is harnessing the power of electricity. How one company is going full throttle. That's what happens when aerospace engineers start messing around with waves. When you get a team of aerospace <laughs> engineers and you tell them to design an awesome wave, they're up for the challenge. Wow. Hey, welcome back. And here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Officials are saying the explosion at a factory in Louisville yesterday it killed two people and 10 others were hurt and taken to a nearby hospital after that factory blew up. But there is still no word on what caused the blast. And the L.A. city school system is moving ahead with phone-free classrooms. That new cell phone policy is set to take effect in a few months. Students here won't be able to use phones on campus during school hours. Governor Gavin Newsom signed the bill into law that basically requires every district in the state to create a policy to limit phone use. And over 100 people have gotten E. coli connected to that outbreak with McDonald's quarter pounders. The CDC says 104 people have been infected across 14 states so far. Of those, at least 34 people have been hospitalized. One person actually died. Remember, the outbreak was connected to the supplier of onions. And inflation in the U.S. rose a bit with new numbers coming in today, jumping to about 2.6 percent, which matched expectations from economists. Now, this happened, though, despite the Fred, uh, Fed cutting interest rates last month. That's a sign that things are still a bit sticky with the economy. And the squirrel, who was taken from its owner and euthanized, did not have rabies after all. The New York Environmental uh, Office took the famous squirrel last week, saying it received complaints of an illegally held wildlife. That caused a firestorm online. Officials say the squirrel bit a state worker involved in the investigation, but Peanut had thousands of followers who are now demanding accountability. And one of the biggest questions in the universe on Capitol Hill today, a congressional hearing about whether the government is hiding a secret program collecting information on UAPs or UFOs. Do you believe, just for the record, that um, the federal government, any part of the federal government, is knowingly concealing evidence about UAPs from the public? Yes, sir. 100 percent. Yes. Yes. And those witnesses have a combined 50 plus years of experience in the military, defense, aerospace, investigative journalism. They include a former Navy rear admiral as well as former Department of Defense officials and a NASA official. And among the testimony, the revelation of a supposed secret government program documenting hundreds, maybe thousands of UAP sightings. This is going to be uh, the original document from the Pentagon about Immaculate Constellation, 12 pages about this unacknowledged special access program that your government says does not exist. Immaculate Constellation serves as a central or parent USAP that consolidates observations of UAPs by both tasked and untasked collection platforms. Immaculate Constellation includes high quality imagery intelligence and measurement and signature intelligence of UAPs. OK, so let's see this report. Well, here it is entered into the official records of Congress. You can Google it, a 12 page report on Immaculate Constellation, something the Department of Defense has previously denied existed. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin joins us now. Uh, Julie, so let's start big picture here, because this is now the third UAP congressional hearing in the last three years. What does this say about where lawmakers on both sides of the aisle stand on the issue of UAPs? 
got the third one in the last three years and the second in just this same Congress. So this shows you that their interest in this topic is only ramping up, not waning. And the bipartisan interest is clear. Look, we heard from lawmakers who were in that room, who heard this testimony from these officials, who said that they really want to peel back the curtain to expose this program to the American people. Nancy Mace, uh, who led this committee hearing on the Republican side, she's the one who introduced that 12-page report into the record that you just talked about. She said she spent years in this investigation talking to whistleblowers, compiling photos, videos, uh, evidence of what they say the government is in possession of, potentially UAP technologies, uh, and other things the government has potentially seen, but that the American public don't know about. All of these things, according to Nancy Mace, are classified. She uh, even said that she could get in trouble for sharing this, but it goes to show you how importantly and how seriously members of Congress are actually taking this. And Julie, what could we see in the new administration when, when it comes to UAP transparency? So this is actually interesting because we keep hearing with the new role of the president-elect Trump, with his new cabinet taking shape, with these programs that he's putting in place, his goal and MAGA's goal is to really dismantle institutional structures, to dismantle the establishment. A program like the UAP secret program could actually be something that could come to light in a potential Trump administration. Nancy Mace, for example, saying she's not scared of the feds come after her. Well, if Trump decides that this is something he wants to investigate, he could potentially publicize it, and he's in good graces with Nancy Mace and some of these other Republicans. So maybe we could see more of this. Certainly he has Elon Musk on his team of SpaceX. He has people who are interested in space. Trump himself has always been notably interested in space. Maybe we could see the curtain peeling back a little bit more, showing facts to the American people that are more out of this world than we saw today in that hearing. And Julie, uh, I mean, you cover closely cover more hearings than probably anyone I know. Uh, the Immaculate Constellation testimony, that is, that is making headlines. But just because it's in the official congressional record, that doesn't automatically qualify it as absolute truth, right? No. And members of Congress can enter anything into the congressional record, right? It's like if they want to bring some piece of paper or a testimony or even an article they read online, they can choose to enter it into the congressional record. Still significant, though, of Mace to say, hey, look what I have. The government doesn't want me showing you this exists because this is a secret program they're saying doesn't exist. I'm showing it to all of you. She published it online. We saw it in the hearing. So clearly they just don't care at this point. And like I told you, I think we're going to continue to see more of these hearings in the future. Hope so. It's either the biggest story ever told or not. <laughs> Julie Serkin, thank you. And joining me now is the chairwoman who made today happen, South Carolina Congresswoman Nancy Mace. Congresswoman, thank you for being with us. Those of us who have been following this very closely have been hearing whispers of the words immaculate constellation for a few months now. You went out and put it straight on the record. Why did you think that was important? Well, it's important that if the Pentagon or other federal agencies hiding these programs that they deny from the American public, and yet we learn recently that it actually does exist, the American people ought to know the truth and the facts. There's so much that we have overclassified. Uh, you, know, you can't talk about the date of some of the, the alleged uh, UAP imagery, for example. Uh, some of the witnesses couldn't even describe what they've seen because of the way things have been overclassified. You can't talk about the budget for some of these programs because that's classified. We overclassify everything into what end. Does it really make America safer? I don't think so. And the American people deserve to know the truth. It must have been very frustrating for you, sitting up there and not being able to get a lot of the, those straight answers was for mm -hmm. people that were watching it, too. And then, and then you posted this very mysterious report for the public to see with alleged mm -hmm. details about Immaculate Constellation. What is in here is wild. I mean, there are, and I'm paraphrasing, but reports of F-22s getting, like, boxed in by flying orbs that they couldn't shake. There were satellite mm -hmm. images or satellite image of a, a football field-sized flying saucer hiding in clouds seen from um, this satellite looking down. Have, have you seen any of this footage or these images? I have not seen those images or footage, but of course, we're going to want to go digging for it in a skiff right mm -hmm. after this. But the thing that the question I asked Michael Schellenberger, the journalist who was there testifying today, was when he wrote this report about the Immaculate Constellation, was uh, did he have more than one source and the type of sourcing he used? He had multiple sources, they had clearances, they were very credible individuals, and that's really important detail when you're bringing forth this kind of information. Absolutely. And Congresswoman, the testimony we heard today, I mean, it was suggesting that around the time 
that Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon helped get those black and white videos out in 2017, uh, that's when this like shadow program was spun up to kind of vacuum up all the data in a way that the public would not know. Uh, that, the allegation, if I understand it correctly, was that it was done out of the executive branch, which would have been President Trump at the time. Uh, the president right now, he seems to be, or the president-elect seems to be appointing some pretty heavy hitters that have been demanding UAP transparency to his cabinet, like mm -hmm. Rubio, Ratcliffe. What do you think we're going to see next year when, when Trump takes office on this? I hope that we'll have the most transparent and accountable administration in U.S. history, not just for UAPs, but across the board with every single federal agency, because the American people overwhelmingly voted for the truth and voted for transformational changes within the federal government. And that should be one of them. Transparency should be a part of that. We had great witnesses say, including the Admiral Gallaudet, who said that, you know, emails were deleted. Uh, when they started talking about the UAPs that were witnessed on a ship when they were out and deployed at sea. So we learned a lot of information. We learned information that the government denies. They say there is no there there. These things don't exist. But yet we learned today that there are federal employees and individuals injured by crashed craft retrieval programs and being paid by the government and compensated. So you can't tell me it doesn't exist. And yet you have people who've been harmed by, by retrieving craft. So and are being paid by the government for those injuries. So it's it doesn't add up, and we have a lot more to investigate. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, fingers crossed we'll get some, some solid answers. Last question really fast. I mean, we saw bipartisan curiosity here. Do you think mm -hmm. that's going to continue? Oh, I, I hope it does. And, and U, UAPs is a place where both Democrats and Republicans alike have come together to demand transparency, to demand government accountability. And the other thing that we've been doing, too, is we've been working together to protect whistleblowers. There are people that have come forward since the last hearing. There will be more people that come forward, I hope, after this hearing. And we're doing our best to protect those individuals, Democrat and Republican alike. Congresswoman, we can't thank you enough for your time on all this. Thank you. Of course. And coming up, rising again, we are getting closer to the grand opening of the historic Notre Dame Cathedral. Our Kelly Cobia takes us inside the final preps and the planned celebrations there. But first, you got to see this. In her last high school race, an Arizona cross-country runner was going for a personal best until she saw another runner who had just fallen short of the finish. So she stopped. She took her by the arm. She helped her cross the finish line. Her dad caught the heartwarming moment on camera. It's gone viral on TikTok. The runner has already received several scholarship offers since. Talk about sportsmanship. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. 14 people were killed in Pakistan today after a wedding party bus carrying dozens of people fell into the Indus River. Now, local reports say the bride and groom are among the dead and 12 people are still missing. Authorities say the accident was caused by the driver speeding. And a CIA official has been charged with leaking classified documents that appeared to show Israel's military plans to strike back at Iran. His name is Asif Raham, and he was arrested by the FBI in Cambodia yesterday under the Espionage Act. He is due to appear in federal court in Guam tomorrow. And today, a Palestinian Islamic Jihad militant group released a video appearing to show an Israeli-Russian citizen being held hostage. That is 28-year-old Alexander Tronovov, uh, one of the dozens captured on October 7th. His mother says she is happy to see him alive and asked him to stay strong while urging the Israeli government to, quote, save him now. And demonstrations broke out tonight in Paris to protest a pro-Israel gala, which was expected to include Israel's far-right finance minister, but he ended up canceling his trip. All of this happening the night before a soccer match between Israel and France in Paris tomorrow, which of course comes on the heels of the recent soccer violence involving Israeli fans in Amsterdam. And in less than one month, one of Paris's most treasured landmarks, Notre Dame, will finally reopen. Parisians and tourists alike will finally be able to step inside that cathedral more than five years after the fire that devastated that iconic building. NBC's Kelly Cobiea has more. Our Lady of Paris, one step closer to opening its doors again. And the Companions Choir's 80 members holding final rehearsals ahead of the big day. Set to perform in one of the solemn masses at the week-long festivities next month to celebrate Notre Dame's rebirth. 
These amateur singers are also the craftspeople and artisans who helped repair the cathedral over the last five years, like art restorer Felicia Lamprecht. Was this project different? It's extraordinary. I don't think in my lifetime I would have possibility to work in such total um, renovation. The blaze back in April 2019 was devastating. Flames reduced the beloved old cathedral's ancient oak ceiling to ash, tearing through its interior and spectacularly toppling the spire, a cherished Paris landmark. Craig was here for the aftermath of the tragedy. Paris, how much this cathedral means. Now, five years on, France is racing toward the cathedral's grand reveal, its vast lead roof installed. These wooden hangers that helped secure the fragile structure after the fire removed, following years of delicate, laborious restorations. And last Friday, a taste of the much-missed Notre Dame bells, sounding across Paris for the first time since that inferno silenced them. Rescued from the catastrophic fire, now repaired and ready to ring again, alongside these special three Olympic bells, delivered to Notre Dame last week. Notre Dame's meticulous revamp, a well-kept secret, but we were shown a tiny hint last July. Underneath the spire, the intricate oak frame. We're at the base of the spire, a thousand pieces of wood carefully put together. The spire's wood base and oak ceiling complete. More than a century of soot cleaned from these murals and stained glass windows. They're just stunning. They're so bright. The colossal restoration effort now in its final stages. A sacred space reborn, getting ready to receive the world again. Kelly Cobiella, NBC News. Looking forward to that, Kelly. Thank you. And still ahead, the risks of new technology falling into the wrong hands. We're going to take a closer look at the implications of using AI for national security. That's coming up after the break. Hey, welcome back. It looks like every tech company these days is launching their own open source AI. And Meta's version is called Llama, and the tech giant is making it available to U.S. government agencies now for national security and defense. Now, Meta says it's in part to help establish U.S. open source standards in the global race for AI leadership. But what if it gets in the wrong hands? Well, earlier this month, Reuters said it already did exactly that. The People's Liberation Army in China allegedly used an earlier version of Llama to develop its own military applications. Meta telling Reuters that any use by the People's Liberation Army was, quote, unauthorized and contrary to their acceptable use policy. Uh, let's bring in national security analyst Clint Watts. Clint, could open source AI mean trouble for national security as much as it could help? It could, uh, you know, as you always look at these things, they're either tools or weapons. What is, you know, essential to understand about these models right now is they run on a set of data and they're not that different than open source computer code in the sense that we've always advocated oftentimes for open source code so that communities can use it and build from it, but they can also check it for things like bugs or, or, or weaknesses and vulnerabilities. In the case of these models, uh, most of them so far have been used for information retrieval, the same way that you and I have maybe used it when we've tried different uh, open AI uh, models that are out there. Those uh, GPT models are usually used to retrieve information. And in most of these cases, especially I think with this Llama model, it's used for something very similar, applications that are layered on top or essentially models layered on top of applications to retrieve information. So yes, it could be used in, in that way, but it would only be some sort of a base layer. And we shouldn't you know, overlook the amount of massive amount uh, of AI innovation that will come from this, which allows really anyone to use those models and try and build from it as well. What do you see as the biggest risk here? I think the biggest risk is, you know, can one nation or many nations working together in the free world really go up against other models that are coming from authoritarian nations? The one thing about the openness of capitalism in Western markets, U.S., uh, Europe, is that, you know, these companies are competing. They are advancing their models very, very quickly. Um, they're innovating, but that innovation could be handed over uh, to an authority, authoritarian nation uh, that has a more closed system, and they could then build on from it. Uh, that would be closed off from view. So that's one of the risks that's out there. But I think one of the things to remember is that innovation often t comes from lots of different people working on different models. Uh, if a nation doesn't allow that to happen, even internally, uh, and they keep a closed system, it makes it much more difficult for them to keep up. 
a, a closed system with massive amounts of data, right? And when it comes to AI, it's really only as good as the, the, the cleanliness of the data, if you will. Uh, something like this being used by an authoritarian regime or, or, or let's say, China, um, what could happen there? Yeah, I think the question with China, which has many of its own models and AI companies that are very sophisticated, is what is the infrastructure like that they can run this? China obviously has that. What is the data set um, that they can run on, which they have probably the largest uh, sets of data in the world? And then the sophistication of the model. So does an open source model allow them to move forward in a very dynamic way to where they're building from it? Uh, all of these are still somewhat open questions. But in terms of applications, uh, for the most part, what we're seeing is it's knowledge management, information retrieval, uh, things like search. That's primarily what it's for. And then generation of computer code. Uh, knowing how to code is part of it. And a lot of these models can help you do coding much, much quicker. It sounds like a recipe where it's the, the power um, of open source and the power of closed source together. Uh, just a dangerous combination there. Clint Watts, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And when it debuted back in 2006, 23andMe revolutionized genetic testing. But today, the company is not doing too well. It's forced to uh, cut about 40% of its workforce right now. And NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has the very latest. When 23andMe launched nearly 20 years ago, the promise was enticing. My DNA journey started here. Millions of customers eager to upload their DNA. 23andMe Research is focused on discovering new information about genes. But earlier this week, 23andMe's CEO warned investors that there was substantial doubt that the company could keep operating, announcing it was cutting 40% of its workforce, 200 jobs, and it will stop development of its therapeutics division. The stock price cratering 75% this year. And while the company says it is looking to go private and isn't looking to sell, some customers may be concerned about their very personal data. For people who want to erase their accounts with 23andMe, is that possible? Yeah, so in the, in the privacy policy, it does say that individuals can um, request for their um, account to be closed. Um, and if that happens, they delete the sample um, and, and delete the account. The financial update comes just two months after the company settled a class action lawsuit stemming from a 2023 cyber attack. Data for 6.9 million customers was posted on the dark web. 23andMe agreeing to pay $30 million and give those customers three years of security monitoring. In a statement this week, 23andMe says we are committed to protecting customer data and are consistently focused on maintaining the privacy of our customers. That will not change. The future of their business may depend on it. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. Stephanie, thank you. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything. And we are talking going electric on the high seas. We're going to go for a ride with a company trying to bring EVs to the world of boating. And you know how to take it for a spin. So we're going to show you how they're making waves coming up. All right. All right. Tell. <laughs> You're hey. voting, man. And it's tonight's future of everything electric cars. We get so used to seeing them out there on the roads, but have you ever seen or heard an electric boat cruising the waves? Well, one company is trying to become the Tesla of the high seas, so of course, we had to take one out for a little joyride. On a dock in Long Beach, California. Hey, Rich. Hey, <laughs> welcome. Going? This, this is it, huh? A glimpse of what could become the EVs of the sea. A lot of these docks already have power, and so you just plug into that just like you would a car. This is how you're getting the juice, huh? I mean, if you don't look out at the horizon, this feels like an electric car. You got yeah. the display. This is a backup camera, I guess. It would be the wakeboarding camera, but it feels like you're in EV. We want this to be a very familiar experience to people. But once underway, we're moving. We're moving. There is no sound at all. <laughs> the New York Sport sounds more like a sailboat than a 500 horsepower speed machine. If you spend some time on boats, it's usually like a... Yeah, at this, this point, is... we're already having to yell at each other. Yeah, down, exactly. So. This is a different boating experience for sure. And if you've driven an electric car, you know what's about to happen next. <laughs> Arc boats are just the latest entrant into the growing electric boating industry. 
which up until now has seen most manufacturing done in Europe. While America has seemed content with its power boats that get even fewer miles to the gallon than a fully loaded semi-truck. Why has it taken so long for boats to become electric? It's because there was no supply chain to support this sort of build. What's happened in the past five years is that the automotive industry has continued to pour money into research and development and establish these supply chains that we are now able to take advantage of. And since launching three years ago, Mitch Lee and his co-founder Ryan Cook have been pulling engineers from SpaceX, Tesla, and Rivian and have decided to try for a now familiar business model. Instead of starting small and simple, they opted to design for the most demanding use case first. Just like Tesla started with the Roadster, ARC is going full throttle into wake sports. It's quieter, you don't have the fumes, it's more reliable, it solves all these core pain points with owning a boat. Up until now, the biggest hurdle for electrifying power boats has always been battery size. Boats require a lot of power to move through water. To sustain that amount of power, you need a lot of energy, which means a big battery pack. Fortunately, in wake sports, weight is a bonus. They say the battery and software they've designed equal about four to six hours of high-intensity wakeboarding for an overnight charge. Not quite a full day, but they've gotten costs down to about $250,000 per boat, which is comparable to their gas-using competitors of similar size. As for the Wave, Mitch says their software allows them to do what other wake boats can't, dial in a wave with precision. There she is. Look at that. You've almost yeah. got a curl. That's what happens when aerospace engineers start messing around with waves. When you get a team of aerospace <laughs> engineers, you tell them to design an awesome wave, they're up for the challenge. Wow. Do you want to try it? I, I'm not dressed for the occasion, but yeah. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Okay. All right. All right, let's go. All right, we're going in jeans. <laughs> Woo! Let's go! It's hoping to convince an entire industry to leave the days of gas-powered waves in their wake. Ooh. All right. All right. Pal. <laughs> You're hey. voting, man. <laughs> My jeans did not appreciate it, but I sure did. That's going to do it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.